Good evening. Welcome to our Ascension Worship Service, the coronation of our victorious King. The victory of Easter continues to march on. We are not merely passive observers of it, but we participate in that victory. And today we see that power from heaven marches victorious even to the ends of the earth. Our opening hymn is printed for you in your worship folder. On Our sermon text from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times and dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of our Lord. Dear Christian friends, if you have ever seen the launch of a space shuttle or a rocket, you know the feeling of craning your neck as high as you can and squinting until long after you can see much of anything anymore. Now you even get to see some of those rockets come back down to earth the same way you saw them take off in the first place. And then they land on these barges named funny things like, of course, I still love you. I always imagine that this is kind of what the disciples looked like on that day. Craning their necks, staring into the sky, squinting their eyes. In our text, we find the disciples with their feet still planted where they were when Jesus was talking to them right in front of them. But now they're staring up into the sky. Their teacher and their friend, their Jesus, was ascending before their eyes. They could hardly comprehend it. They saw what they saw, though. The very, their very eyes saw him rise right in front of them. They saw the clouds hide him from their sight. Apparently, the only thing that tore their gaze away from this sight were two men dressed in white who suddenly appeared there next to them, asking them in verse 11, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? So now what? Now what? Perhaps that was a question that was in the hearts and minds of the disciples. Maybe it has been a question in your mind after a big Easter celebration or really seven weeks of celebrating Easter, right? Well, now what? What's next? Even after Jesus had appeared to them multiple times, proving to them over and over that he was alive and risen from the dead, they asked, verse 6, so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? See, they had their own ideas of now what? Right? Did you catch it? They, they thought now is the time for Israel to be strong again, right? And so, so often is the case even with us, our now what 
is rather limited in scope. The disciples were still wondering if Jesus was now going to kick out the Romans and make the political nation of Israel into the center of his kingdom and his reign over the entire world. Some still, no doubt, had their visions of bearing swords and making this earthly political reign a reality. And when you think about it, I mean, what better time to do something like that, right? Now, after, right after his biggest miracle yet, rising from the dead himself. Surely, this would be a wave of power that they could ride all the way until this earthly kingdom was established. What would be more powerful than that? Instead, Jesus had much, much bigger plans. In verse 8, we read, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You can almost see the disciples' hearts. Like, first they say Jerusalem. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then Judea. Okay, that makes sense. Samaria? What? All, all the earth? This is way bigger scope than what they were even thinking. We struggle with the same limited scope as the disciples did. What? Tell someone I don't know about Jesus? What? Tell, tell someone other than my family members about Jesus? Talk about my faith? With, no, those are, those are private things. Right? My dental hygienist, poor, poor lady, she was, she was always saying, we're told not to, tell any, not to talk about politics or faith or religion or anything like that. And then she's like, but we always end up talking about religion anyway. <laughs> right? Tell someone else other than my family? These are, these are private things. We're not supposed to talk about them, right? Oftentimes, oftentimes we are timid, right? We are weak. We're scared. The disciples were willing to wield physical swords for Jesus, misguided as that was, but we have a hard time even wielding a few words for Jesus. Maybe one wonders, though, what was Jesus really thinking here? I mean, just leaving the spread of his entire kingdom to a bunch of bumbling Galilean fishermen? To go around the, the hillside and, and, and from town to town just telling people what they saw with their own two eyes? That's it? That's the plan? Even throughout the book of Acts, you see all the hiccups of the church, right? The problems along the way, struggles, pride, doubt, fears, weakness, temptations, and more and more. All of it seemed to always be in the picture. Kind of this mucky mess. Yet, Jesus was absolutely true to his promise. True to his promise that they would be his witnesses. He was honest in giving the power of the Holy Spirit to his disciples. And how in the world do I know that? Well, how did you come to be here tonight? Was it really pie? Maybe it was kind of, right? But it wasn't just pie, right? How did you come to be a part of this congregation in way western South Dakota? How did you, how did you even come to be a Christian? How did that happen? I mean, for most of you, it isn't really even a tearjerker, powerful, adventure-laden, heart-wrenching story. How did that happen? You know what it is? Somebody told you. Somebody told you. Parents, grandparents, pastors, Sunday school teachers, friends, neighbors, somebody told you. And what did they tell you? 
What did they tell you that made a difference, a lasting difference, an eternal difference? It wasn't their story, but Jesus' story. What he came here to do for you. In other words, you are living, breathing, hopefully you're all breathing, proof that these men were Jesus' witnesses to the ends of the earth. Because if you look at a map, we're basically on the other side of the earth. Not only that, those they witnessed to became witnesses to still more and more and more and on and on and on until you. And here we are today. For almost 2,000 years. How is this possible? What power did he give them? What could be greater than the resurrected Jesus standing there with nail-pierced hands and feet inside that you could touch and see? Walking around with you, walking through walls, eating fish in front of you. What could be more powerful than all of that? A wonderful pastor and friend made this for me when I came here and was installed. And it's got what's become a favorite passage to me from Romans chapter 1. I am not ashamed of the gospel because, and you know it too, right? Because it is what? The power oh, of God. What is that power? It is the gospel. This passage tells us what that power is. The good news that Jesus is the Son of God who was born into this world, lived the life that I could not live, died on the cross, took the punishment and the condemnation that I deserve for my sin, and then he rose again, bearing the wounds in his hands and side and feet to prove that his payment for my sin was full and complete and enduring forever and ever. He rose to life to show that sin and death and hell were conquered. And now he has ascended and returned to the glory he set aside in order to come here and be my Savior. It's the good news. The ascension of Jesus means that his work of saving us is finished. It is complete. And it means that right now he is reigning over all things. As our text from Revelation paints the picture of him as a fierce warrior king who not only fights against and defeats his enemies, but also one who fights for his people, even you and me. And what that means is that he is, every moment of our lives, even right now, interceding for us. When you think of Jesus' ascension, be reminded of this. He is interceding for you. Many times at the end of a person's life, when they don't have earbuds in and constant emails and texts flooding their brains all the time, they've got more time than ever to stop and think about their whole life. And it's at times like that when Satan wants to just weigh you down with all the guilt and shame and doubt that he can. Right? Well, what about when I did? What about the time when I said? What about the person I? Right? And he wants to weigh you down with all of that. This is why you need Jesus' ascension. Because what is he doing even in those moments? But he is interceding for you. And he never takes a break. This is 24-7. Right? He stands before your heavenly father with his nail-pierced hands and feet and the wound in his side all as a testimony to the sacrifice that he paid for our sin once and for all. For your sin and mine. 
All of this is that beautiful gospel. Friends, this gospel isn't some Sunday school story. It's not, it's not just a, 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 a child's story. It is, granted, the story of God's dearly loved children, how he made you his dearly loved children. But this is powerful. From childhood on to the day that you die, this is powerful. Name me any man-made power, physical or mental, that has the power to turn a lost and condemned soul, an enemy of God, into a dearly loved child of God and heir of eternal life. You can't do it because there is no such thing other than this. Ascension Day is like the coronation of our Savior King. It's really just as amazing as Christmas and Easter. This is our King's welcome home. This is our kings returning to the glory that belonged to him for all of eternity. The choir of angels were the most glorious thing around on the night that he was born. We think of the star in the sky that led the magi to worship him as their prophet, priest, and king. But now, at his ascension, He is the one that the spotlight is on, and he is glorious. Only two men in white are there to redirect the disciples yet again, because they always need redirecting, just as his church always needs redirecting. Now what? Now what? The work of winning our salvation was complete, but the work of sharing the good news That was just beginning. Jesus said that he would come back soon. Our days are numbered. And the days of the people around us are numbered. And this adds a sense of urgency to our witness. But also the greatest comfort. He comes to bring us and all who believe in him home at last. He's going to return, the angel said, in the same way that they saw him leave, which was in glory. He's going to return in glory. Why? Because, of course, he still loves you. And he is preparing a place for you. Until then, not only did he give that power to the disciples, the power of the gospel, but he has given it to you and me now too. The most powerful thing in all of the universe. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed that you can't physically see Jesus right now. He promises to use even us as his witnesses too. And he will do it. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.